Rosie Weasel uh, named me that because I had uh, brown hair when I was a baby, a long, light brown. And so she would say, look at this little Sunk Pei. And so after that, I just, uh, uh, that's what they named me. So when I got older, my, uh, my grandmothers and my aunt said, do you want to change your name? We're going to change your name. And I said, no, I don't want to because I want to be, ca I was called that and I'd rather be Sung, Sung Pei. And they said, why do you want us to add we on it, which means woman? And I said, no, just Sung Pei. So I've always been Sung Pei. My dad had to go find work in them days. They had to go off the reservation to find work. So my mother left with him, and she left me with grandma. So it seemed like uh, the Indian tradition, I think it is, because uh, I've always asked why do I have to be left behind, you know, because, you know, you want to be with your folks. And my grandpa told me, well, the Indian tradition is that the oldest grandchild, uh, the Cinnaboyne tradition, was raised by the, uh, the grandparents so that they could keep all the traditions, the values, the heritage, the language, so that they could teach it to the siblings and teach it to the rest of the people. That was the way the Cinnaboyne saw it. So they always kept their oldest grandchild. My grandpa was an extraordinary man. He was like a... Uh, how would you say, a philosopher or something? He always said stuff like, all while I was growing up, he would tell me in Indian, he would say, you gotta, uh, you gotta learn the English language, you gotta learn everything, and you're smart. He said, when you grow up, he said, everything's gonna change. He said, it's not gonna be like it is now. He said, you're gonna have, uh, uh, the lifestyle's going to change and everything's going to uh, be like a white man type of thing, he used to say. So he said, I, all, I want you to go to school. He said, there's going to be more white people come in here and they're going to overtake you and they don't gonna want you to learn, teach the language or learn the language. You're going to speak straight English, he said. So he said, you go on and he said, you go ahead, you you don't never lose your, what I taught you and what you know. And I said, okay, Grandma, Grandpa, I'll promise. He said, your grandma will be here, but I don't know how long she's gonna be here either, he said, so. And he died when I was 10 years old, and I remember they brought me from the Lodgepole School in a wagon, because they didn't have no buses or something. Anyway, they brought me home to uh, my, uh, he said, your grandpa's dying, you have to go back. So I think I got there about 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and uh, I went in there and ran in there, and grandpa, grandpa, I was really saying, and he was laying there, and, and he told me, he said, he put his arm around me, and he said, he said, I gotta go, and I said, gee, grandpa, where are you going? Can I go with you? And he said, no, he said, you can't come with me. He said, try to explain to me that he was gonna die. And I said, no, you're not going to die. You've been sick here for a long time. You never did die. What you going to die for? You know, just talking to him like that. And he said, now listen to me. He said, don't say anything. He said in Indian. And, he, and so I said, so I, I was used to being, I always really mind good, you know. And so I jumped on a bed and sat down by him and he said, he said, you know, you promise me something. And I said, okay, I'll promise you. He said, you go to school. You go to school, you do good, you finish, you go on. And he said, you, you get this education. He said, and always remember that you're Indian. Never forget your language. Remember everything we taught you from the time you were little. And he said, and he said, you go ahead. And when you have children, you teach them and you try to help everybody because in many years from now, he said, we're going to all be like white men. And then so they said, well, come on, they said, because he started coughing. They said, come on now, I'll take you outside. So here, when they took me outside about half an hour later while he died, and I went back in and I said, how come my grandpa's sleeping? 
and they said, oh, he died. And, uh, and I said, well, he didn't even say goodbye. And, and my grandma said, he did. He said goodbye to you, remember? And, uh, I, and so that's how uh, um, I've always thought. I've always had it in my mind. And then luckily that John, my husband, spoke the Cinnaboyne language too. So we worked with the, on the kids. So uh, I've worked on it nearly all my life, you know. Everywhere I go and everything I do, I try to bring the culture and the history, even if it's just mine, you know. And I try to uh, get people involved with their own. And so then I and so then my mother had my sister, and later had my br two brothers. But they never did. She used to always come back and see me, but she never did take me. And I used to wonder why, because I was little, up to about seven years old. I used to wonder, how come they don't want me? I thought they didn't want me, you know. Till later years, I found out that uh, it wasn't that. But that's the way I was raised. The welfare was always coming, and lucky my grandfather was a policeman and a forestry person, but they used to always come thinking that uh, I wasn't getting taken good care of and stuff, and so my grandma used to hide me in a closet. They had a wooden closet. She'd hide me in there, and she'd give me water and bread, and I'd sit in this closet, and that welfare woman would come, and she'd just come to visit. She, uh, but my grandma always thought maybe she was coming to take me and so she put me in this closet and I'd sit there for about a couple hours maybe three hours and uh, and she used to tell me don't go to sleep you stay awake she said because if you go to sleep you might kick it or you might do something that I'll have to open it mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said I slept I stayed awake until she left because in them in them days you know the uh, the welfare had a strong um, on the Indian people. By then they were taking all the the kids and giving them to foster care and sending them away to different places. The people that didn't have good households, you would say, I think they, uh, they were the kids that they took. I was lucky that my grandpa was a cop and a, a, a forestry man and my grandma never drank or anything and she took care of us. and. And my grandpa never drank either, so I think that's the only re reason why I wasn't taken away, but I, they were really working on it, you know. I didn't speak English. I spoke straight to Cinnaboyne. And my grandmother did go to school in Fort Belknap uh, uh, boarding school, but she only went far as the uh, third grade. And my grandpa went, and he went far as the second grade. And uh, he said that he never did do much uh, homework or studying the English language or nothing because they, he worked outside. He said they made them uh, tend to the cows and milk cows and tend to the pigs and tend to all that stuff like that because they were all big when they first came to school. He said he was about 13 or 14, he thought, when they took him to school down here, but all they used him for was to work, him and old standing bear. He said used to work together. They got along really good. And uh, standing bear was older than him. And so he said he never learned, no, didn't learn nothing but how to work. And then my grandmother said she did go to classes up until the third grade, and she did learn some English. But my grandpa did not allow any English in our house. So everybody spoke the Cinnaboyne language. And, uh, uh, and then my grandpa did spoke Grovant because he was half Grovant. Um, so I learned some Grovant, and I learned mostly Cinnaboyne. When I was six years old, the welfare came again, and they said I had to go to school. And uh, that was before 
they made uh, the rules here at Fort Belknap that you could be up to eight years old before you required to go to school, you know, and uh, that was made in their, I guess, their uh, tribal constitution. But anyway, my grandpa said, uh, uh, I'm going to take you to the school and you're going to stay with this teacher, he said. And this teacher's going to teach you English. And, and I didn't want it. I kind of balked and everything, and I usually had my way with him, but he wouldn't give in. He took me to this uh, teacher, and then I stayed there with her on weekdays, Monday to Friday, and she taught me English. And how she taught me English was by singing. She started uh, playing the piano, and then she'd get me up there and have me sing with her. And that's how I learned how to sing the, the uh, singing the English language, you know, the different words and stuff. And I remember Montana, Montana. Then I used to sing something about uh, in my sweet little Alice Blue Ground. And after a while, she'd make me perform. I'd go to these different schools and I'd perform, dance and sing, mind me of Shirley Temple. Well, anyway, I end up uh, uh, helping out in the school. I went to a uh, day school to the um, boarding school there. It was board, not a boarding school, but it was like a, a government school. It wasn't a day school yet. It was a government school by the BIA in Lodgepole. And uh, so, uh, like, a lot of kids came to school not speaking uh, English. Then in them times, that was in probably in the early 40s. And so then uh, I had to tell them what this was and what that was. and. Like they'd ask me in Indian, what was this? And I'd tell them, you know, desk or... And I remember they were really interested in all the dolls and the toys and stuff because nobody had toys, like the beds. I used to have to tell them that was a bed in Indian and, and, and then I'd tell them in English what it was and stuff like that. Then the, the main thing was, is asked to go to the bathroom because some of them they wouldn't let them go unless they said it, that they had to go to the bathroom. And a lot of them would pee in themselves. And, and so I used to tell them to say, you know, I taught them how to say, may I go to the bathroom, you know. And uh, so we'd be on the playgrounds and I would be talking to them in English, trying to teach them how to say, may I go to the bathroom? I said, that's all you have to say. Teacher, may I go to the bathroom? You know, and so then uh, as they went on, a lot of them learned to speak English, but they did not punish us for speaking the language there, not like the mission did. They uh, corrected you. And it was a one-room, two-room schoolhouse. They had first kindergarten, no, no, they didn't have kindergarten. They had first grade to uh, fifth grade in one class and sixth to eighth grade in the other class. And that's how they, uh, they had only two teachers. And then we ate downstairs on that day. And then later in years, it turned to a day school. So, uh, and everybody still talked the language. When he went to visit people, they spoke the language. I taught school for one year, fourth grade. Then the tribe offered me a, the Head Start director job. Because that summer I had got the head directing job, I mean the director job out of Billings to do Head Start in uh, Lodgepole. And he said, if it successfully passes, then we will give you, we will uh, fund the whole reservation. So it did, it passed, the kids went good and everything, and they learned a lot and everything. So then they offered me the job of the director here at Fort Belknap, so I, direct, was a, so I quit the school and I came to direct uh, Head Start. And that's where I start, start first started getting all the old people to come in and uh, <clears throat> teach the language. Both Cinnaboyne and Grovant at Hayes and Cinnaboyne here and Cinnaboyne at Lodgepole. 
and I had like Gil Horn, all them fellas still there, and everybody, and we would have sessions. We would write down all the words and everything, and we start doing, I got them together to do, uh, like draw pictures and stuff and try to teach the culture and the history to the kids, and they were just little guys. People would kind of make fun of me. This was in the 70s, and they would say, um, it's gonna never come back. What can we do with the language, the Cinnaboyne language or the Grovant language? What can we do? Everything's English, you know. But I said, yeah, but it's still your, your heritage, your traditions, where you come from. These kids got to know. I always wanted to get educated. And then, you know, I couldn't really go to school because I was not head of the household. I came down after I graduated in 50... 53, and I came over here to uh, from high school, and I was married and everything. I came and I tried to get a BIA loan because everybody else was going to school and the BIA was sending them to school. Well, I always remember that superintendent told me, well, you're not head of the household. We'll send your husband, but we won't send you. And, and I argued and argued with him, and I never did. So finally, I was so frustrated and then finally I wrote to the Indian uh, oh, college fund out in Denver and they uh, gave me enough money to go to one year of school and if I did all right they would give me some more so and then my husband said that he would pay my uh, gas bill or whatever and he bought me a car it wasn't a very good car, but it was good enough to go to school, so I drove to Northern. It was 37 cents a gallon, I remember. And then I used to have to have, like, uh, hamburgers was about 90 cents. So I'd always buy a hamburger, and that's how I went to debating them professors, because they gave you the white man version of it. And I remember I got really low grades <laughs> in history because I contradicted everything that they said, you know, and I was supposed to go with the book. But I got enough to pass, you know, I got a C and everybody else would get B's and A's and there I was getting C's and it was so frustrating. And so then from there on, that's how I, um, and I thought, well, I'm going to teach school, you know, and I'm going to teach the right thing.